This program contains dramatic reenactments and material that may be disturbing to some audience members. Viewer discretion is advised. It's every mountaineer's worst nightmare. Ah! Falling into a hidden crevasse. Ah! 80 feet down, when no one can hear your cries. I could hear the fear in my voice. One climber must conquer his fear and a sheer wall of ice. You can't climb this. Nobody on the planet can climb this. In an epic struggle. It was just absolute sheer terror. He must escape before the sun sets. Or he'll freeze to death. I was going to climb until I got out. Or until I was dead. Best friends and mountaineering partners, Jim Davidson and Mike Price, are fulfilling a dream. To climb Mount Rainier, one of the highest mountains in the US. It's gonna be a crazy mad day. You ready? Let's do it, Jim. <laughs> Let's do it, bro. The two men have been climbing together for four years. I first met Mike in 1986. We were both going to Colorado State University. We had a, a like mind and a, a similar love for the mountains. As Jim and Mike have scaled mountains all over the US, their friendship has grown deeper. Mike had a great deal of mountaineering experience. I looked up to him as a, a better climber than I'm more experienced. But Mount Rainier will put their climbing partnership to the ultimate test. As they plan to scale the fearsome Liberty Ridge. I think what excited both of us was it was going to be a step up in our friendship and our partnership. On the third morning of their trek, they're ready for the final leg of their trip, up to the 14,000-foot summit. Climbing fosters very intense relationships. We experience the difficulties, we experience the rewards, and you're sharing it with one person who you like and whom you trust a great deal. For Jim, this is his toughest climbing challenge yet. But being attached to his far more experienced friend, Mike, means he's in safe hands. You OK, Jim? Oh, man, this is tough. Just check your balance a little. I would look at the climb and go, wow, I, I don't know if I can do this. Oh, oh. It looks a little steep, a little scary. I can't do it, bro. Just come over a little. And Mike would gently push me forward. Ah, you're doing good. I thought, well, if Mike thinks I can do it, then I probably can. Mike's expert leadership means that their final push to the summit goes without a hitch. Woo. Just as I pulled myself onto the ice cap, Mike was sitting down with a big grin on it. Welcome to Liberty Cap. <laughs> Their reward is spectacular views on a perfect day. It can be a very spiritual experience where you're up there and you actually feel connected to the earth and to something even bigger. And to have those magical moments in the mountain, you have to put forth the work and you have to be willing to accept some risk. For Jim and Mike, making it to the top is the ultimate high. Having realized their dream, they're now ready to get home to their families. But first, they face a tricky decision. The most standard descent routes 
are on the south side of Disappointment Cleaver. That would have worked fine for getting down, but would put us on the opposite side of the mountain from where our car was. So they decide instead that it will be much quicker to take the shorter northeast route down. It's a straightforward eight-hour trek back to base. Hey, Jim. Yeah? I don't want you thinking about a nice, cool beer. Hey, lay off. <laughs> but Jim and Mike are also aware that they must stay alert. They know that hidden just under the snow, the landscape is a minefield of cracks and gullies, the worst of which are huge crevasses. All of the glaciers on Rainier have crevasses, these big cracks in the ice. Sometimes they're open and you can see them, and sometimes they're hidden over with snow. And as the hours pass, the risk of crevasses increases. The sun softens the snow, weakens the ice that can make the route itself more likely to collapse. But Jim knows that being attached to his friend by a rope means that if he does fall, Mike will dig in and use his body weight to save him. They're literally holding your life in their hands. All right, it's a little deeper here, okay? And that creates a very intense bond and a very intense friendship. But an hour into their descent, they realize that the route they've chosen catches the full heat of the sun. As we descended down, we started getting hot very quickly. And we could feel the sun beating down on us. As the temperature rises, the surface snow is now weakening all around them, fast. Okay. Our boots would sink in deeper and our ice axes would sink in deeper. Jim and Mike are now only inching forward. Baby steps, Jim. Will do. In these conditions, one false step could be deadly. Just take it easy, Jim. And all of a sudden, I sensed something. Whoa, whoa. Below me, the ground just dropped off. We got a big crevasse here, buddy. We're not going this way. OK, Jim, take it easy. Let's try going left a little, OK? It's been a close call, and Jim now realizes that real danger is lurking all around them. I probed the ground in front of me, and it felt solid. Take it easy now, Jim. Yeah, we're good. And I stepped forward and sank up to my ankle in the snow. Whoa! And I probed a second step, and my ice axe felt solid. So I stepped forward. No, we're good. My face smashed up against the snow. And I realized I wasn't going to be able to stop myself. I yelled, falling! swung my arms and legs around in the darkness. And I realized this is a big crevasse. If Mike can't get a grip in the slushy snow, then nothing can stop them both plunging to their deaths. It seemed to progress very slowly. 
bad time to think about what was happening and what might happen and how we were going to land. It was just absolute sheer terror. I was tied to Mike, so I thought in another second or so, the, the rope will get tight and catch me. As Jim speeds downwards, he knows Mike only has a few feet left to dig in and break his fall. I thought 10 feet, 20 feet, 40 feet. Mike should have caught me by now. And I put my hand out, and I could hear how fast I was moving by the high screaming pitch of the nylon glove dragging on the wall in the darkness. And when I swished around, it felt kind of empty, and I realized that my wrist loop had slipped off my hand. My ice axe gone now. There's no way I can stop myself. Then my brain told me that I'd fallen 50 feet. I thought, no, that can't be right. If, if I'm in 50 feet, and there's 50 feet of rope between me and Mike, that means he's right at the lip of the crevasse. And I'm going so fast now, he's going to have a heck of a time catching me. And I thought, come on, Mike. Dig in, dig in. Because I knew that he was getting close to the edge. I felt the rope jerk once, and then go slack. And at first I was confused, I didn't know what that meant. It was, um, a sense of helplessness and sort of a soft sense of sadness like well now there's literally nothing we can do The violence of Jim and Mike's 80-foot fall has triggered something every climber dreads. An avalanche. I was stunned for a second or two. Jim is completely trapped and is unable to move. I could feel the weight pushing down on my body. I can't believe it. I survived that fall, and now I'm buried alive? He has only a tiny pocket of air around him and will suffocate in minutes. You really can't control the fear. It just surges up. <laughs> I couldn't see that I was going to be able to get out of the snow. I was probably felt truly helpless at that point. Now I just have to sit here and wait for the end of my life when my oxygen runs, when my oxygen runs out. In desperation, he summons every last atom of strength to try and find a way out. I try to focus all my mental power and physical power in just my right hand. I pushed with all my strength just on one spot, just pushing my right arm up. Jim has survived, but there's no sign of Mike. Mike! Say something, buddy! I heard Mike answer back. I heard him nearby. And what 
I heard was a groan. Mike? Mike! I knew that he was hurt, and he was hurt bad. With no one to break his fall, Mike has suffered the full force of the 80-foot drop. And I heard his breathing get more labored and more labored. Mike, answer me, buddy! And I started digging at the snow faster. Say something, buddy! I heard Mike exhale once, and then he didn't inhale. And I thought, no. No, no, no. It, it can't be that he's not breathing. I must have just missed the sound of him inhaling and exhaling. Mikey. Stay with me, buddy. Mikey! Mikey! I couldn't quite believe what was in front of me, but I had to accept the reality. I had to accept that he wasn't breathing, and I had to do something about it. Stay with me, buddy! Mike! I didn't get any response. I could just feel this surge of fear boiling up in front inside me. I did one more check of pulse in his wrist and his neck and looked for breathing signs and I saw none. No, 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 no. Come on, buddy, wake up. We're getting out of here. <laughs> Come on, Mike! God damn you! <laughs> my hands started to shake, and my upper body started to shake, and the emotions started creeping up on me. After four years, and hundreds of hours climbing together. Jim has just lost his closest friend. I just slumped my head against his chest and I could feel the tears welling up in my eyes that my friend was gone. <laughs> Jim is alone. Trapped 80 feet down a colossal crevasse. And without his climbing partner, his chances of escape have gone. Unsettle me. I could hear the fear in my voice. Oh, Somebody help me! After screaming for hours, Jim is finally forced to accept that so far down, he can't be heard. I thought, no one's going to come and find us. And so I pretty much stopped yelling after that. No one will even know he's missing for at least another 18 hours. But by nightfall, temperatures will drop to a deadly minus 40 degrees. I realized if I was in here when it got dark, I wouldn't be alive the next morning. And that's when it really hit me that if I was going to get out of here, I was going to have to do it myself. I was going to have to do it today. Jim knows he only has a few hours to scale an 80-foot sheer cliff, or he'll freeze to death. And it's the most difficult terrain he's ever seen. The ice walls went vertical, and then they started 
peeling back inward and leaning inward in an overhang. We're in trouble here, buddy. And without thinking, I just said out loud, oh, Michael, we're in trouble, man. We are in big, big trouble. Not in a good way, buddy. There's no way I can climb that. Maybe the best climber in the world on their best day can climb it, but I'm not that good a climber. That's it. We're done. As Jim resigns himself to his fate, he realizes it's a miracle that he's alive at all. And he has Mike to thank for it. Mike was slowing me down. And it was Mike slowing me down that allowed me to survive that incredible fall. Jim knows that unless he attempts to escape from the crevasse, Mike's death will have been in vain. I could see him in my mind's eye just saying, start climbing, you can do this. Let's go. But as he begins to try and move, he makes an alarming discovery. Very slowly, I began to be aware of a bad pain in my left shoulder. And a lot of blood came out of my mouth. I didn't know what that meant. I was afraid that uh, I had some severe internal injury. But one of his ice axes has been lost in the fall. If he doesn't find it, he'll never make it out. As he searches around, Jim makes a terrifying discovery. He and Mike have landed on a fragile snow bridge, likely to collapse at any minute. We weren't on the bottom of the crevasse. We were stuck part way down the crevasse. But 10 feet below him, Jim spots something. The missing ice axe. He knows he's faced with an horrendous choice. I'm not going deeper in this crevasse, where it's tighter, more dangerous, scary. If I go down there, I might not be able to come back up. I thought there's no way I'm going down there. But when I thought about it, there was no other answer. I realized if I wanted any hope of climbing up, I had to go down there first. took a lot of willpower to back over that edge and lower myself deeper into that crevasse. A single mistake, the ice axe will be lost and there'll be no way back for Jim. I turned the tide a little bit, that now I was taking some action. I'm starting to fight back, perhaps. Jim realizes his situation is perilous. He must start climbing immediately. But he's missing a vital piece of kit. I thought to myself, well, I could use Mike's helmet. And it was difficult, but I knew that Mike would want me to use all the gear as best I could for the team.
Jim now faces the most difficult climb of his life. One of those doubtful voices in my mind would flare up and say, you can't climb this. Nobody on the planet can climb this. He's utterly alone and knows he has only six hours to escape the crevasse. I just started feeling a cold wave like flowing from my head down towards my feet. All right, Mike. And I realized it was fear. Uh, fear just filling me up from the top down. Uh. I decided I was just going to start climbing, and I was going to climb until I got out or until I was dead. And I just smashed my dice axe down on that first move. I think I let out some kind of, some kind of karate yell or something. And before I started losing momentum, I just placed that second tool. Using only ice axes, crampons and screws, Jim is now climbing completely alone. Without Mike to break his fall, the slightest mistake could be deadly. I realized if that one screw failed or collapsed, I would be plummeting back down past our ledge, even deeper into the crevasse. Every inch of his climb is physical and mental torture. Almost imagine myself that I'd been swallowed by a monster, and now I was starting to crawl my way back up that throat. Climbing back towards those big overhanging white snowy teeth. Every second counts. Unless Jim reaches the top of the crevasse by 6 p.m., the nighttime temperatures will kill him. Keeping a rope attached to his friend, Jim feels that he and Mike are still climbing partners. I would make it out by leading away up this wall and we'd both get out. Or I wouldn't, and we'd both be here. But either way, we're still a team. But after climbing just 20 feet, Jim's adrenaline levels are falling. Each step harder than the last. I hadn't eaten anything or drank anything in many, many hours now. And Mike and I were both exhausted from the three and a half days of alpine climbing before the crevasse accident happened. Weak and exhausted, Jim senses hope draining away. I heard this little voice say, keep going. I could see him in my mind's eye just saying, you can do this. Check your balance a little. I felt that he was still sort of remotely coaching me, if you will. You doing good? And, uh... It wasn't goodbye yet. We were still in this together. Ah, ah. You're doing real good there, man. After climbing for what seems like an age, Jim has barely made it a fifth of the way up. But with every step, conditions inside the crevasse are getting far worse. The afternoon sun is melting the top of the crevasse, pouring freezing meltwater down onto Jim. It was soaked all the way through, and it would refreeze on the ropes, refreeze on my jacket. And now the midday surface heat is creating an even deadlier situation. Oh. 
Huge chunks of ice are now plummeting 60 feet down towards him. The size from a microwave up to the size of refrigerators or bigger. As the ice above him continues to melt and splinter, Jim can only pray that nothing hits him. Sometimes I heard them coming, and sometimes I didn't hear them coming. It felt like the crevasse was maliciously toying with me, trying to scare me, trying to throw me off guard. With the threat of being killed by falling ice at any moment, Jim now has to move faster than ever. But there's a problem. The walls are now leaning in towards him. I thought, boy, this is getting really steep and really hard. It was putting a lot of strain on my chest and arm muscles now. As he inches upwards, Jim knows that the ice screws attaching him to the wall are the only thing standing between him and death. But the melting walls are getting more unstable. And when I started fiddling with the gear, I had one hand off my ice axe. four or five feet away. And that banged my head pretty bad. And then that tipped me upside down, and I smashed back into the ice wall below my ice screw. And now just one ice screw holds him between life and death. I realized if that one screw failed, I would be plummeting back down past our ledge, even deeper into the crevasse. I was kind of shook up and panted and kind of got myself recollected. But the ice screw had held like it was supposed to. As the walls are now leaning in too far towards him, he knows there's only one option. He must switch to a different climbing technique, aid climbing. Aid climbing on ice screws is Rarely, if ever, done. And I had never done it. I never met anybody that had done it. Aid climbing involves hanging loops of rope from a wall screw and using them as footholds. Jim knows the theory of it, but it's a world away from actually doing it. It's brutally physically demanding. He's already exhausted and faces scaling 60 feet and an overhang with this untried method. Worse still, he hasn't got the right gear. He must improvise with just a few lengths of nylon and five ice screws. Very awkward, very pathetic substitute, but it's all I had. If Jim is to make it out alive, he must now use everything that Mike has ever taught him. I was now climbing my ice steeper than I ever had in my life. Uh. Without Mike to help him, Jim has to constantly climb back down to retrieve his ice screws, costing him precious time and energy.
hours of grueling climbing. Jim is within touching distance of his last great obstacle, the overhang. If he can get past it, he'll have only 20 feet left to climb. But he's beginning to realize that he may be on his last reserves of energy. I was physically winding down, and I could see myself moving slower and slower. At this point, I think my body was kind of grinding to a halt. Jim's loneliness, exhaustion, and despair are finally too much for him. I was starting to feel so beat up physically and psychologically, I wasn't sure that I was going to last long enough. I had absolutely no strength out there. Jim has lost a mountaineer's most powerful tool, his self-belief. I started thinking about Mike. And his parents at home. <sighs> now all I could do was get out of here and let them know what happened to him. Even though no one would have known if I just gave in to the cold and sleep, that wouldn't be honoring the people that had helped me and what they had taught me. Mike teaching me to always give your best for the partnership. You don't give up just because it's hard. You stick with it. Jim knows he must find the strength for one final push to the top. made it out and collapsed there and died there, that would be success because they'd find me and follow the rope back to Mike. And so we'd both be found, both get off the mountain. Watched the spit drool down a little bit, and the blood froze in place on the wall. And I realized that was actually kind of a marker, marking how far I'd progressed up the wall. It was a psychological game to prove to myself that even though it was painfully slow and horribly scary, that I was making progress. After 65 feet and hours of hell, Jim's made it to the overhang. It's the only thing standing between him and the lip of the crevasse. I knew I was close. But to get past it and get out alive, he must risk everything. Now I had a severe problem. I couldn't reach past the lip. I can't do it, bro. Just come over a little. And I thought, I have to do it, I've got no choice. Jim's only option is to try to haul himself over the edge of the overhang. If he makes one single mistake, he'll fall to his death. Made it. I've secured myself to the upper screw, and I took my ice axe off the lower screw so that I could hang onto it. 
I realized I had just made a huge error. Jim has broken a climber's golden rule. He's attached himself to his chest instead of his waist. The chest harness cinched down around my chest and squeezed the breath out of me. And some voice in my head was just screaming at me, saying, it's all over. You're going to die hanging from this ice screw. I was gasping for breaths. I would get one occasionally when I would get one ice tool in the wall. I could get a little weight off, and I would get two breaths, and then I would slip and slump back onto the sling, and it would squeeze me tight again. I had to get off that ice screw. Unless he can find one last surge of energy, Jim knows he has just seconds left to live. back down at our ledge, some 60 feet below me now. I realized that I was really out there on the extreme edge of what I thought climbing could even be. Finally, having achieved what seemed impossible just a matter of hours ago, Jim knows he has only 20 feet to the top and escape. But I was so utterly exhausted from everything I'd done, I questioned if I was going to be able to have the strength to make that final run to the surface. But the last few minutes of daylight are disappearing fast. With temperatures inside the crevasse now dropping dramatically, Jim is desperate to end his ordeal as quickly as possible. I thought, wow, if I can free climb, I can, I can free climb 15 or 20 feet in just a minute. I'll be out of here in just one minute. And I started to get very energized by it, very uh, attracted to the idea that with just one minute of energy, one minute of effort, I would be out. And I heard Mike's voice just clear as a bell, and he was like, don't. He said, you're not strong enough, you might slip, and if you slip and fall, it'll be all over. You can't take that risk. He knows that Mike's words could be the difference between life and death. No matter how hard and time-consuming, Jim should carry on aid climbing. I couldn't hold the ice axe up anymore. That one or two pound ice axe became too much for me to bear. And I was truly getting down to the end of my, my energies. After more than five hours and 80 grueling feet, Jim reaches the surface. But unless he can get a firm grip on the treacherously thin snow, he could easily slide back into the crevasse. I can't believe at the very last second I'm going to fall backwards, all the way back down to where I came from. I can't believe it's going to end like this. Uh. And this emotional voice in my mind was like screaming, do something. Uh. And this voice was pretty confident, it said, just lunge. Uh. I looked back where I had last seen Mike just before the fall, and I could see where he was standing, and there was a very sharp groove in the snow that proved to me that Mike had dug in as hard as he could to catch my fall. And then I untied from the rope. By finally untying the rope that connects him to Mike, Jim knows that he has fulfilled his duty to his best friend. And Mike's family will be able to take his body home. <laughs> 
all that emotion that had been trapped down inside me for over five hours just gushed out. And I just said out loud once, I'm alive. Uh, hello! Jim's cries for help are finally heard by two park rangers and some volunteers. That's when I knew that, that I had been seen. I'm up here! <laughs> and that help was on its way. Mike Price's body was recovered the following day. And, thanks to him, Jim survived with only minor injuries. But before returning home to his wife, he had one last thing he had to do. The last day when Mike and I were climbing together, we talked about coming off the mountain, maybe having a big steak and uh, buying a couple beers. So I went into the uh, bar. And I ordered uh, two beers, one for me, one for Mike. Thanks. And uh, I sat there and drank them both. Since the accident, Jim's never lost his love of the mountains. He now teaches new climbers to respect the power of nature. And each year on June the 21st, Jim makes a special climb to celebrate the life and times he and his friend spent in the mountains. <laughs>